All right, we're live. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the third episode of Bitcoin Kindergarten. Today, me and Optimus have a really special guest. Katie, say what's up. Hey, hey. Thanks for having me, guys. What's up, Katie guys? And Anna. Katie and Anna is um, one of the, uh, I almost said founding fathers. Uh, <laughs> she's one of the founders of, um, she has a toxic ladies Bitcoin group um for it's a place where a lot of the girl bitcoiners go and on bitcoin twitter from what i've seen it's mostly guys so it's nice seeing um girls in bitcoin as well and um katie's obviously one of the really cool ones one thing she told me uh she went to craig wright's uh court case and actually got chased out of it (laughs) um yeah, that's the yeah, first Katie. time I saw Katie. That was pretty legendary. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to uh, say good. a little bit about that? Or... Yeah, it was absolutely cool experience. Um, back then, I was actually living in Mexico already. Before that, I lived in Miami, so part of my family was there. And I kind of needed to go back. And then I saw the court um, scheduled, court court hearing for Craig Wright um, scheduled for, like, it was last last year june i was like well i'm just gonna put together go to this court i showed up and uh obviously there is like kind of privacy for this for this hearing like you can bring your phone you can bring your computer in well from russia so somehow i don't know what happened but i got through um you know this uh you see that the x-ray machine kind of with my phone got into the courtroom and was live tweeting through the whole court hearing. Um, and then about, so it started at 9 a.m. About 4 p.m. We we're still there. And uh, um, Greg Rice lawyer is like looking at me weirdly and going slowly to the judge and tells him something into, into the ear and like looking at me still. I'm like, well, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so apparently my tweets went viral and he saw them like lawyer of Craig Wright actually saw me online tweeting that. So I'm like running out of courtroom realizing that I'm in trouble. And I know there are like multiple uh, stairs. I'm not taking the elevator because like it's leading right to the court guards. I'm trying to find another exit or something. Then I'm just running through the door, trying to if whatever. I'm running away. And court, four court guards running behind me, one of them touching me as I'm opening the door to exit the court, and like throwing me to the bench. Give me her phone. Give me her passport. Like I realized they already have like my picture and stuff, and obviously they know my Twitter handle. So then I was like, all right, I'm in trouble. I'm Suddenly in trouble. Uh, so they got me back into the courtroom, and Judge is like, "Okay, Katie, come to the microphone." And I'm like, "Shit!" So I actually made it to the transcript. Like the guy who who's scripting the whole uh, court hearing uh, was printing all that stuff. It's pretty hilarious. So he was like, "All right, Katie, don't worry." And I'm like, you know, obviously stressing out, not knowing what's gonna happen after that. And Judge is like, it's all right, Katie. Tell me about you. What are you doing here? And I'm like, really sorry, Judge. <laughs> English is not very good. I might not understand what you're saying. I'm from Russia. He's like, it's fine, Katie. Don't be nervous. You understand English. I'm like, I'm really sorry. I didn't know. I didn't take pictures. So he's like, it's fine. It's on us too. Like four court guards. Uh, x-ray machine and all that stuff and somehow you still had the font in the courtroom so the court guards are gonna get in trouble too and uh yeah uh, i didn't get in trouble my lawyer said i was supposed to get 30 days and five thousand dollars fine and uh yeah i'm still here i'm not in jail good thing <laughs> good time and then i obviously went to second court here and i decided to spend the whole summer in miami just because of all those hearings when I showed up to second hearing, I was trying to look like completely different, like put my hair a different way, wear different clothes, like completely different style. So I'm walking into the courthouse. The court guard is like, oh, Katie, where's your phone? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> and then I'm walking into the courtroom and the same judge is like, oh, Katie, you're back. I'm glad. I'm like, Shit. <laughs> it didn't that work. Hilarious. That is actually hilarious. 
All right, well let's let's talk about toxic ladies. So um I think I think um we got you on here because one of our friends, Proof of Steph, was giving us jokes about how last week with Hoddle was just a bunch of boy talk. And I know we don't uh, need to get into gender specifics on why, you know, ladies should be Bitcoiners. But what's a, what's a shill or the pitch that you do for the women around you that you've been uh, congregating at Toxic Ladies? Toxic ladies actually ended up being pretty cool experience that I, I didn't expect to have. Uh, I was just putting together a group. I was like, that's something different. Why, why don't we have like, toxic, like, why don't we have ladies uh, flip chat pretty much? So first we put all the, like, proof of staff and I were the first people there, obviously. And then we got some more girls. And then Bitcoiners from Twitter, like, started reaching out and be like, hey, like, my wife wants to be in, like, hurry and i'm like okay so now it's like 25 of us uh some of us are like hardcore bitcoiners some of us extra heart of hardcore bitcoiners who wants to learn more and overall it's been pretty cool yeah not toxic uh it's kind of more of a onwards i mean i was called toxic gajillion times for all my life views in terms of like anti-feminism I bullshit and all that stuff. So, like, yeah, if we if we're being called toxic for being kind of truth seekers and reasonable, we might as well come out and own it. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. So uh, let's talk about. You said you got some. Uh, what you say you got a few people on boarded this last week, didn't you? Yeah. So after you guys uh, asked me if I would love to talk about like boarding um process and people who just come into the space i was like damn like, i've been surrounded like i've been in the bubble of bitcoiners for quite some time now like all my friends are bitcoiners literally all of them um which makes sense because you know i moved from russia i kind of abandoned my previous life there uh, and after that i got into bitcoin almost right away so i made all new friends in this country through bitcoin so I was like, all right, it's time to actually talk with newbies and like try to get them on. Um, and somehow all three people that I've been talking to ended up being girls. And uh, I actually think that girls naturally not very interested in Bitcoin. Like you kind of have to have uh, a lot of this uh, somewhat masculine um, mentality at some point, like in some cases. So I think we don't have a lot of girls in the space like for reason, obviously. But my sister was into that, but I was actually going through experience with her, asking her questions, made her doing all that stuff like by herself. And then uh, another girl I also onboarded recently, she's mom of two. She literally got her first Bitcoin through local Bitcoins days after she gave birth to her second child oh. i was like how did you do that because like there is no onboarding on ramps uh, in russia like actual on ramps you only have to go through local bitcoins or like otc she figured it out i mean she's she's a very smart girl she's pretty good at math and technology so she got it That's uh, but cool. yeah i just wanted to see what's going on in the world right now and what kind of mistakes people would do uh, in their first steps and what seemed to be confusing and like we know all the resources and all the companies you need to go through to be safe and to be okay. But I was like, I don't know what's uh, in Bitcoin spaces, like how it looks like from somebody who doesn't know where to go. And I actually identified really bad things for asking my sister and asking Anastasia that you guys know. Mm -hmm. So did you get any question in particular? like? the first thing they asked you? Oh, yeah. My sister kind of like into stocks lately. And she's like, but Katie, like, how am I supposed to buy 50 bucks of Bitcoin if it if it costs like $9,000? And I was like, all right, this is the first thing. Because all the people who are into stocks have to buy a full share. So our cash app came out with their Shivers stocks. Yeah, my sister was like, I, I can't afford to buy $9,000 right now. I'm like, okay, so Bitcoin actually consists of 100 million Satoshis. And you can buy 
the amount you can buy dollar worth of Bitcoin and spec sets. Yeah, well, well, perfect segue, Katie, because that was one of our questions is you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin and you can stack sets, but you answered the whole thing. So that's, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, oh, go, Nick. I wanted to add something on. Um, in terms of you don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin, I know on Cash App, I can buy one penny's worth of Bitcoin, which is, you know, obviously the lowest amount of USD. So it's like you can really buy any amount you really want. You can either buy a penny's worth or a million dollars worth, you know. There's no limit to what you can and can't buy. Yeah, and me coming from a teacher's monthly salary is 200 bucks, I understand that my teacher would never be able to invest into stock market because, like, how am I supposed to buy 2400 per share of Amazon if my salary is $200 a month, right? So Bitcoin is, like, for everyone, for real. Like, it's not only for each. It's only for those who have good income or have healthy wealth or savings it's for everybody you can buy one dollar you can buy five you can buy 100 rubles anything is for you and that's one of the things that is really exciting about bitcoin is that it opens up the financial world to all these people who previously didn't have it before um you know especially people in third world countries um i remember your your little uh, talk about toxic ladies made me a re made me remember an article I read when I first got into Bitcoin, which really you know touched me and saw how life changing this could be. And the story was a lady, and I don't remember exactly what country this was, but it was somewhere in the Middle East, I'm pretty sure, and she was not allowed to um, handle her finances her husband was supposed to do that for her and um she eventually started getting money i don't remember how but she would little by little buy bitcoin and hide it from her husband and when she got enough money she was able to um flee the country and afford a better life for herself in a better country and i just think that's amazing yeah it's a beautiful story yeah. absolutely Right. I think uh, it's a good point to say that you don't need to have a lot of money. You just need to adjust your behavior. And as most of us Bitcoiners have learned is that over time you adjust your time preference. And so by that is you change your behavior and you sacrifice little things here and there so that you can buy more Bitcoin so that your future can potentially be better. And it's more of a, a like a personal choice than just needing a lot of money. It's like, okay, I think I want to save for my future. And, you know, Bitcoin is hope. It's changed my life. It, it really Delayed is. gratification is really big thing that a lot of a lot of us took from it. And I thought it was not part of my life before. I was like, no, I, I was a regular kid who would spend money. But then I kind of thought through my previous experience as a child. And I remember like I made a thousand dollars when I was uh, nine. And like if I was just nine year old kid that didn't take didn't care about the future, I would probably spend it on cool stuff like, like Lego, I don't know, games or stuff. But I was already doing some sailing. and I was like, I'm just going to invest it into my boat and, and get a better boat for sailing. And next year I got into national team and started making money out of it. And when I realized it was kind of delayed gratification back in the day, I was like, wow, good job, nine-year-old Katie. I'm proud of you. <laughs> then the I had the same test. experience. <laughs> I had the same experience at 21. Uh, you guys probably know my story that like, I never ever tried alcohol in my life. And uh, it was like a, a bet with my mom. When I was nine, I made this bet that I'm not gonna try any alcohol, cigarettes or drugs or anything until 21. If I if I don't, I will win a thousand dollars. When I got those ten k, uh, my sister had the same actually the same bet, and she got a car, and uh, I decided to buy language school in the United States, like buy a course in language school and immigrate uh, to the United States. This money, so like that's kind of delayed. 
like now I like care about it. and only when I get big returns, I'm like, okay, I'm going to invest it. I'm just, you should not buy this another kills. Katie's born for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I actually think I just had all the right experiences in life bring me here uh, to bring me to Bitcoin. Like my life literally pushed me to Bitcoin and there was no chance I would stay the way uh, but if I actually learned. Agreed. Uh, Nick, we cut you off a few times. Did you want to add something? Um, I did, but I forgot it. So <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, go back to it if I remember it. Uh, how about uh, you tried to onboard some friends this week and you had a pretty good experience with uh, your friends and your family. Let's let's get into that one. Yeah, so um, I was talking with my parents first because my dad likes to, my dad doesn't understand Bitcoin at all. And he likes to try and like rile me up about it. And he was like, I walked downstairs one day and he looked at me and the first thing he said was, Hey Nick, how much big, how much money in Bitcoin have you lost? And um we just got into this big argument about how like I'm telling him that he has the potential to lose a lot of his savings for retirement because of inflation and hyperinflation, blah blah blah. And he's telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. And then he said he doesn't understand how bi- he uh he doesn't understand how bitcoin can be like the world reserve currency and he, i was like well you don't re- you barely know how to use your ipad and your iphone so you got a long ways to learn you know you got a long ways to go before you real um realize how big bitcoin is actually going to get and then um he was saying how like he just doesn't trust Bitcoin. And I was like, well, do you know what fractional reserve banking is? Do you know what quantitative easing is? And he said, no. And I was like, well, dad, you got to learn how the current financial system works and the history of money um, to really understand how important Bitcoin can be. So uh I took the Bitcoin standard and I'm rereading it and I'm highlighting through really important parts as well as annotating and writing little notes. And I was curious and I posted a picture of it. I just posted a picture of the book and me reading, uh, me reading it down by the water where I live, trying to uh, set up a little bait to see if anyone on my Snapchat would take it. And I did, um, I got a kid who I haven't talked to in years, a kid I used to play soccer with. He um he hit me up and he was like, man, why don't you just trade stocks and options? And we got into a little conversation and he was open-minded to it. Uh, I sent him over some podcasts and some slideshows and stuff. And um, when I get back in town, I'm going to meet up with him and um, talk, uh, tell him all about Bitcoin and I'm going to lend him my uh, copy of the Bitcoin standard so he can read through it. And yeah. Beautiful. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, there's just one point with uh, your dad. It's funny. Um, Cause as I said, before we started that us young ones, the young guns out here and, and our friends, it's like, we're living in a new paradigm. We've like, we've shed the old thinking of the old world and we're working on this this new economics and this new world and we just we can see it so plainly but people are still stuck with that old mentality and they still believe those old myths of the old world that got them to where they are and it's like your dad's a prime example of it and it's you know it hurts us because they're our loved ones and we just we wanted to shake them and be like man like listen to us like we got the golden ticket, you know, we got the answer, guys, like, come join us, and, like, you only need to buy a little bit of Bitcoin at a time, and just, you know, just keep being consistent, and, and it'll be, it'll do wonders for you, and they're like, yeah, like, shut up, you're an idiot, and it's just funny how we all experience basically the same thing over and over, and we're still just trying to help people. It's, it's funny to me, because it's like, you know, my dad's a boomer, I'm a, I'm a zoomer, um 
there's a huge age gap there. And it's funny to me how my dad has lived his whole life not knowing anything about the financial system. And here I am, 20 years old, getting educated with everyone else on Bitcoin Twitter on, you know, what money actually is. And um, I tell him, I'm like, man, you know, like, I'm telling them about the Bitcoin standard that I'm going to let them read. And I'm like, dude, if you look, the U.S. dollar has served its purpose, but it's clearly time to move on. And um, the money, the hardest money, looking throughout history, the hardest money with the best stock to flow always wins, no matter what. And um, easy money like societies collapse under easy money and the money we have right now is very, very easy money. And it's just so plain and simple for us because we, you know, we've studied this, we have the knowledge, but it's something very hard to comprehend. It's like, it's almost unbelievable. And they're just like in denial. Normalcy bias. Well, in my... Go Katie. My case my dad is kind of pretty red pill because um, he's kind of well educated on the finance system. My mom knows nothing about this and she only like respects Bitcoin and knows it's a cool thing because she like trusts me and knows that I would not recommend a bad thing. So um, maybe you should try this different approach in being like, like because it's probably gonna kind of push your dad apart from yourself and all the way around, right? And none of you want it because you love each other, your family. So maybe you should like come to him and be like, dude, I understand that you don't want to learn it, but like this is something that I value a lot. And if you love me, please just let me fucking try to educate you on that. Like just trust me here. And maybe maybe that's something that that will convince him is not something that like been helping with that. I think like, like my mom is pretty open to it, but she doesn't understand that, like, she thinks that, oh, Bitcoin is going to go up and it's going to skyrocket and do whatever my son says, but that's not going to affect me if I don't touch it. Um, and that's not always true, you know, as a Bitcoin goes up, the US dollar is going to go down in purchasing power and that's going to affect them whether they want it to or not. And um, moving on to, we have a question in the chat that ties into this from Coin Education who says, can you give some historical examples of money converging to the most saleable and perhaps expand on one attribute in particular led to it? So what comes to mind is two uh, examples from the Bitcoin standard. One of them was from the Yap Islands I believe it was the Yap Islands. And um, for money, they had these huge stones that were imported. And um, they were rare because they were so big. They took like tens to, I don't remember the exact amount, but it took a ton of people to move those stones into the town. And you can't move them around. They're not very divisible. So they used those stones for large purchases and they would leave the stones in the middle of the town because they were so big no one was going to steal them as well as everyone in the town knew who they belonged to and if you sold it you let the town know and the town kind of came to you know consensus that okay these this stone got sold to this person and he is the new he or she is the new owner but there was someone named, I believe his name was David O'Keefe. He came along and saw this and he went to where they were getting these big stones from and he would blow them up. He would break them up into smaller, more portable um, units. And he kept taking them to um, the island to try and get people to... Um, exchanged them for goods and the the island chief was like no you can't do you, you know you just can't do that you're gonna flood our market with these new stones and um eventually the island kind of was 
fighting, you know, whether, you know, that was a good thing for him to do. Like, should he be allowed to do that? Should he not be? Eventually, people started accepting it, and it flooded the market because he just kept importing new stones. And, um, you know, obviously, the more stones, you know, it the inflation went up is what I'm trying to say. And um, so the stock to flow and scarcity are the first building blocks to becoming an asset and money. Yeah. Um, so I'll read that again because I just read that really fast. But um, another thing is um, there were these beads in Africa, glass beads. And um, that's what they use for money. And it was a very hard uh, money with a good stock to flow. And then the... Um, the Europeans came in and they were able to produce these glass beads super cheap back home. But then when they brought them to Africa, that, you know, they had a ton of them. So the inflation went up and they were able to buy up everything. And then um, they flooded the market with all these beads, crashing the purchasing power of it. So, um, yeah, like those are just some examples of what I was trying to get at and the attributes that led to it were, you know, um, the stock to flow, the hardness of it means like you can't have too much of it. It has to be rare and, you know, hard to hard to get. Like for example, paper money today, it's it's really easy to get. You just put paper in a printer and um and print it. Whereas gold or Bitcoin you have to mine it, you know, there's a lot of computing power or like physical power that goes into it and it costs a lot of money and time to create that. Yeah, and just to bring it into the real world or into real time, that's basically what's happening right now with the dollar and Bitcoin. The dollar is getting inflated with trillions upon trillions of dollars and Bitcoin is scarce and it's hard to make or actually you can't make more. And so as the dollar is becoming inflated, the dollar price is plummeting or will soon plummet. Like there'll, there'll be some, some effects that we'll see in the future. And we just had the halving in Bitcoin. And so we have one, one dollar or we have the dollar that's inflating and we have Bitcoin that's a deflationary money. So we're going to see the effects of this happening in real time. The, the Bitcoin price will most likely go up and the dollar price, we, we don't really know what it's going to be because we have, you know, government officials that are trying to make it seem stable, but they can't fight the laws of economics. And so it's going to be a crazy show to watch. Yeah, uh, those examples very beautiful but they're like from back in the day in our world we have a lot of examples that like our generation haven't seen and this is probably where like i got my experiences that led me to bitcoin and this is why your debt your debt can't really see it because like total life has been into even in a safe financial system that kept it going for so long he doesn't really understand that one day it might blow up it might not be the case for the next 10 years. It might not be the case for 20 years. Uh, and this is something that Americans need to realize that, like, yes, you were safe for a long time, but it, it can't keep it longer than that. And I had experience in my lifetime so many times already. That's ridiculous. Like, my currency, ruble, right, in my country, uh, when I was three, it was six rubles per, per dollar. Today, it's 74 rubles per dollar. This is crazy. The purchasing power went down like insanely. Um, and even closer example, in 2015, I was already studying economics. That was literally my major in university. And um, in my sophomore year, uh, I think it was after sophomore year, I'm, I went to Spain for a prim, to prim, prim, Palma de Mallorca for like two months for training because I was the team on Russian team and obviously all my all my savings were in rubles all my money were in rubles on my debit card and while I was in Spain uh in the in the period of two weeks Russian ruble dropped 50 percent compared to US dollar so like it was um I believe it was like 36 
after went to 74 per dollar. I was like, wait a second. So I was in this country for like a couple of weeks. Now I have twice less money on my debit card because my country somehow got poorer two uh, x in the last two weeks. Like something is wrong with this. Like it does not sound real, uh, and something is definitely broken uh, in the financial system. And I was like really good at macroeconomics in my university. Like I got a macroeconomics one, macroeconomics two. And then I get back to university. I'm like, wait a second. Like all I learned there was old bullshit and i dropped out <laughs> <laughs> and um like going off that you know we talk about how shitty it is and um going back to what coin education asked that i spoke to quickly about he said so stock to flow and scarcity are the first building blocks to an asset becoming money correct and yeah um you look at um you look through history at civilizations and um the civilizations that always flourish and prosper are the ones that use hard and sound money. Um, one civil civilizations that don't really prosper and actually kind of go through some dark ages um, all use unsound money. They use easy money. And um, to be honest, like this whole fiat uh, experiment that we've been living in, um, it's been full of war corruption like corrupt leaders governments trying to take as much um of your liberty and freedom as they can you know we got like it makes me think back to uh jeffrey epstein the, um the sex predator who had the island and he was assassinated in a cell because who knows you know what world leaders he would have um he would have snitched out and uh, it just would have caused such a you know i don't who who knows what would have even happened but it's just like under a sound money where it's harder for these people to rise to power um it's just society and human people humans are able to flourish much more because they are able to save more for themselves and everything's just so much better yeah, uh, society thrives when people are able to accumulate capital, and if your your capital is getting slowly drained via inflation, then you can't really save for your future. And uh, this is a good segue to something I wanted to bring up from um, our friend Black Bull on Twitter, and he had this good comment of, of what BTC does, Bitcoin, and he says, BTC is about stopping theft through inflation, confiscation, and censorship, and allowing the wealth gap to start to regress to a more natural state, much, much smaller than now by ending the Cantillon effect. And that like perfectly sums it up, that no longer are we the, the plebs out here, the 99% getting our wealth stolen via inflation and those closest to the money spigot. And so... As we say on Twitter, mm. the next renaissance will seems to be ushering in. Yeah. And um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you also got to look at like taxation, like it's going to be a lot harder to tax people on an unconfiscatable money where you can not only hide stuff easier, but like it it limits the government on taxation and um it's really nice living in america because if shit hits the fan and they like uh, let's just say i'm glad to have my second amendment rights i'm not going to go too <laughs> too deep into that but um i'm sure you can visualize what i'm trying to say what would happen um the american people would not be too happy about that well katie katie might have some views on whether it's good living in the usa or not <laughs> ussa you mean <laughs> uh didn't oh, we get, yeah or yeah you can go on that if you want katie or we so can i know how a lot of people believe that like america is the only country that is like affordable to leave convenient and all that stuff 
And uh, you probably seen my video in the bus stop where I'm saying that out of convenience, we give up our rights, our freedom. And uh, that's exactly what's going on. Like I lived in the States for three years almost. I moved to Mexico and man, I will take bad roads anytime <laughs> to crazy fucking cops that in a woman in New York State way. Fuck that. Like, yes, uh, maybe it's not like streets are not clean or I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe it's not that convenient to live here. You have to go out of your way and be more sovereign uh, as an individual, which is a good thing. But I will take it any day that are like totally robbing us on everything we, we value in life. Yeah, and as, as we were talking earlier today or earlier about how today when we woke up and looked at Twitter, it was pretty it was pretty shocking to see all the authoritarianism happening in, you know, in North America, whether it was that New York subway video or stuff happening in the UK or Canada or or just the the FBI being allowed to search through all our internet data with no warrants. It's it's pretty scary, but you know, hope hopefully we'll uh hopefully most more than just the minority that is us Bitcoiners will will actually do something about it, not just be frogs in boiling water. But it seems like we're just mainly frogs. Nation it's of pretty frogs. ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh the your Hydra on Twitter posted earlier today hey, there is no rules. There are strong men and weak men. And this is literally true. Like all the rules are pretty much consensus, right? So like we let them do that. It's not because they have this right by birth or this right by, I don't know, some some powerful enlightenment universe stuff. Like we just let them have those rights. Until we receive, there's nothing going to change. We're just going to let them go further and further and further. And I've seen it like my parents lived in communism. And until you actually start resisting and start fighting it, like nothing's going to change, unfortunately. And I'm all about like uh, peaceful stuff. And, uh, you say like a violent relationship. But at this point, like they are doing violence towards people all the fucking time. And un until we resist, there's nothing that, that can change. And I believe that's why Mexico is like, doesn't see that at all. Like there was no mandatory lockdowns here. Here. There was no any craziness because there is another powerful um, authoritarian kind of thing, <laughs> such as cartel. So, government knows if they start fucking up, cartels will start fucking with them, and that's pretty much what stopped them. Because there is like different direction power, they just they just can't pull it up here. Yeah, check and balances. Yeah. But before we get too dark, let's uh. Nick, don't we have another question in the Discord? Yeah, um, why wouldn't we go back to a gold standard? Wow. It's just... That's actually something that I wanted to say uh, about coin education question as well. That's kind of aligned with my answer there. He asked if, uh, if uh, stock to flow is something money. And I wanted to mention that Stock to flow and scarcity is what makes something store of value. But for being money, you need to have some other features. I think that Bitcoin has much more of those features to become money than gold. Uh, and the main one of them, which is actually also about stock to flow and scarcity, is uh, kind of sovereign money and uh, radical ownership. How much gold is being owned on paper? And we don't really know if it's a full reserve, right? Uh, and Bitcoin have this radical ownership. You know that if you own it, like it's not somewhere in Singapore in a vault and it might not be there tomorrow because someone robs it. Here you have full control and you know like that's yours. And that's that's one of the things that Bitcoin, ma makes Bitcoin better than gold. Others such as transferability, divisibility, Ability, all that stuff. Like we just, Bitcoin just has so many features. Gold doesn't to become a better money. But like it becomes clear once you realize all that. Yeah, and also I wanted to touch on what uh, a point you made is if we were to go back to a gold standard, 
and you know they're obviously gonna do what a gold standard is they're gonna keep the gold in banks and central banks and uh gold you can't in today's modern age you cannot go around trading gold bars for stuff you're not gonna walk into starbucks and shave off um you know part of a gold bar for your coffee we're going to continue we would continue with paper money backed by gold but the thing is and um what katie touched on is who knows what the banks are going to do they can just go back to doing the same thing they did before not keeping full reserves and printing way more money than there is gold and um we could find ourselves back in the same exact situation and it makes no sense. It's a no brainer to, um, you don't want to trust them again. Why would you trust them when you could just use Bitcoin? And, you know, you don't really have to trust Bitcoin because the way the protocol is, it, it works and it works a lot better than, a lot better than trusting banks. Yeah, I, I've said it a few times that just going back to a gold standard, just like moving backwards and in, in progress, and we already have a, a better alternative. And you know, you can't send gold over the internet, so we're going into a digital world. It's just not going to work. As well like, as uh, you know, the Executive Order Six One Zero Two, which was the confiscation of gold. Um, I forgot what year it was, and it was in the 33. early 1900s, 33, yeah. Um, can't really confiscate Bitcoin, or it's a lot harder to, I should say. I mean, technically, they could, you know, show up to your house and say, hey, give us your Bitcoin, but there, it is uh, much easier to, let's say, hide it, and uh, you could actually just tear up all your keys i don't recommend this at all but you could in theory tear up all your keys break your hardware wallet and remember your bitcoin keys in your head as a brain wallet they how you know they can't get that i actually think that everybody needs brain wallet like situation and it's not that hard to remember like 12 words let's say like it's it's not hard at all yeah, and that this is a perfect segue because uh, I I tried to do some shilling this week with some of my friends, and um, one of the biggest knocks or questions that I got was the you can't touch Bitcoin. Like, how how do you use it? And I just kept going on about how you use the internet every day. You use the cloud. Like, you you do a lot of things that you can't touch. Like, you're on the cell phone. And you can't touch it, but yet it still works, and you just need an interface to to interact with it. And I don't think it was getting through when I was telling my friends that, but I think it's a common common question that uh, people new to Bitcoin will will say. I I know how to, how I like to respond to this. I'm like, well, this D is digital, like eighty five percent digital, right? There's no amount of USD that exists in the world, like there is maybe fifteen percent of it exists in paper. Like how do you touch it? It's just numbers in your account, in your bank account, or it's just numbers in your card. Like use some it's gonna be uh, custodial, but you can also use debit card for Bitcoin as well, like loaded with Bitcoin. It's the same thing. So the, again we're coming to fractional reserve and how like banks in the United States have to hold only ten percent um, in actual money, 10% reserve to what they actually give away in loans and numbers in debit cards of people who who hold money in their banks and all that stuff. Like it's just 10% of it, and the rest is just numbers in their fucking centralized ledger. And that's how num like the we keep saying that money printer goes brr, but it's much easier than that. You don't have to do brr. You just have to change. You add one fucking zero in your ledger. Centralized, absolutely. I'm in BBC kindergarten. I'm cursing. Is it? Is uh, it? Yeah, that's all right. Um, we, we yeah, we curse all the time. It's it's technically probably not for children. It's more just to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
But yeah, no, I said the same thing to my friends and I and I just got a blank stare and they're like, what do you mean? Like, I can pull it out to dollars. And I'm like, you can buy anything with Bitcoin. You just got to know how to do it. But anyways, you want to chime in, Nick, or do we have another um, topic? Yeah. Uh, also, like my mom always says, like, I'll ask her to um, look into buying Bitcoin and she'll say, well, where, where, um, well, where can I spend it? And then when I say like not many places, she's like, okay, well then I don't want it. And it's like, you know, chiming into what we were talking about earlier, you need to have a Bitcoin before it can be a good medium of exchange. It has to be a good store of value. And it's very volatile right now because it's early and what the way the halvings work by cutting the, um, the supply issuance in half every four years People like to overshoot and um, pump up the price and then it goes into this big bubble, then it drops down, but it keeps going up and we're well on our way to having it be more stable. And once it's more stable, who knows what price that'll be, but merchants will be, the number go up for merchant adoption is going to um be really big in the future and uh i seriously cannot see a future where 20 30 years from now i'm still paying in dollars versus bitcoin because again the hardest money always wins and techno technology will find a way to get you know whatever problems bitcoin may have right now technology is gonna like people there are so many smart people out there working on Bitcoin and just, uh, you know, technology in general. Like, who would have ever thought, like, pre-2008 that some dude was sitting in his basement or whatever, you know, creating a cryptographic currency that the whole world could run on, you know, decentralized. It's just, there's, you know, people creating Lightning Network and state chains and other second layer solutions and the future is really, really bright. Yeah. Yeah. And it actually brings us back to toxic ladies kind of stuff. Um, you keep asking why not so many women in the space and like women, women will come after the mer merchant adoption because women are the spenders of the family. Like according to the statistics, they spend like 70% of uh, family's money are being spent by women. So what, like, this is what your mom is looking for in terms of value for money. Can I spend it? Can I buy things with that? And this is when we, we will see a big move into, like, female world, kind of. I'm so bullish right now, guys. So <laughs> bullish. <laughs> and uh, this is another good segue, because uh, I was going to bring it up earlier. Or actually, I have it on our notes. And it's uh, this tweet that I saw from Bitcoin Tina, one of our favorite boomers out there. And it got me so bullish this week that I was just so hyped. Anyways, this is what he said. He said, I expect this next major bull cycle to be a super cycle. All caps. Said the first mainstream run, much like the early major bull runs in Bitcoin. Trying to buy an asset of fixed inelastic supply and you will have to pay up. Few will be able to hold on. And I think that like you guys are right. And everyone, you know, this next this next run is going to get out of control like we're going to you know have influencers claiming they're bitcoiners and we're going to have new influencers that are bitcoiners and it, you know it's it's going to be incredible this is going to be some crazy stuff coming up it's toxic ladies we just had this conversation in the chat one of one of our girls posted something with uh she took cardi b's lyrics and changed it into into the bitcoin topic we're trying to make Cardi B see that because she's like totally ready for it. She is not a Bitcoiner yet. She will be because you probably seen her video like ranting about taxation and like, yeah. why the fuck are you taking my money and not using it efficiently whatsoever? So she's either Bitcoiner or she will be. And yeah, definitely. I Everybody's a, coming. I have a recommendation for you. If you could um, 
she's been in the news a bit because she is a beauty YouTuber with over a million subscribers, and she recently fell down the rabbit hole and got into Bitcoin. Her name's Michelle Pham, and um, I know she did a thing with CoinDesk the other day, and um, I'm sure you've heard of her, but if you could some if you could reach out to her and get her in Toxic Ladies, that'd be super dope. Yeah, I was Foolish. thinking about it. I definitely should get there. Uh, she actually, next day after the halving, she got on, like, mainstream media and was so, like, so perfectly articulated what's the block reward and how it's being cut in half and how, like, Fed's printing money and Bitcoin is getting harder. I'm like, good fucking job. Yeah, she's yeah, been killing she, it. She has a huge audience to Red Pill, and um, I got a feeling not many of them are Bitcoiners. Not yet. Bunch of pre coiners though. Bunch of pre coiners, that's right. That's like Matt O'Dell says, like there's like seven point um whatever the population is, seven point, you know, whatever billion minus the already, you know, existing Bitcoiners. They're all just pre coiners. And only twenty one million for them. Let's go. Uh Dinez is in here. I'm pretty sure it was Dinez and he, he sent me a. Uh... The website bitcoins per person and it was saying that if every if there was an equal you know an equal share of bitcoins per every person on planet earth it would only be something like 260,000 sats so like 0. 0.0026 bitcoin is what the the e you know the equal share of bitcoins per person and man it's just so bullish. This is this is really gonna get insane. Bullish. Totally, totally. <laughs> uh, do we have any more comments in in the in the Discord, Nick? Um, let me check. Wasn't there one about value, which is like a good segue with your friend said that on on the Snapchat? Oh yeah. Um. Prime time said, "What gives Bitcoin its value?" And then tell a little story about your friend, and then and then we can get into it. So my friend that I was talking about earlier, who hit me up on Snapchat about Bitcoin, um, he said crypto has no value, and to that I actually agree. Um, I think cryptocurrency, as in altcoins, not Bitcoin, <laughs> alt cryptocurrency, shit coins don't have any value to them at all bitcoin on the other hand has a ton of value you know you can buy it right now for ten thousand dollars and um the what makes bitcoin valuable is two two main things one of them is bitcoin's attributes of being unconfiscatable uh having a cap supply you know being censorship resistant um the you know what you can do with bitcoin it being an internet protocol where you can build pretty much anything you want on top of it uh be able to store it offline and save your money better be able to you know spend on um second layer solutions like lightning and do like a million transactions a second it's just the technology is something so alien and like just out of this world it's insane as well as what gives it real world value in addition to that is the um the people who use it people give it um power people give it value if you you know put your hard-earned money into it and hold it it raises the market cap and um you know buying it raises the price and uh sending it to people and people demanding more and more of it is gonna, you know, raise the value of it. And um, Bitcoin is only beginning. I don't even think Bitcoin has scratched the surface yet of um, the demand it's gonna cause, if that makes sense. Made sense to me. Do you wanna add something? You know how, to yeah. yeah, a lot of people get into Bitcoin because like they actually get in red peel Red pilled on all those features like confessibility, uh, censorship resistance, and stuff. 
then they get into crypto after that because they're like, yeah, insurance on blockchain, whatever bullshit on blockchain. And then like, all you have to tell them is like, go back to your first principles. Like why in the first place you got into Bitcoin? Because all those features. And please now look at your shitcoin and realize that like, is compromising those first principles it's like it's a trade-off always like it's not going to be censorship resistant or it's not going to be unconfiscatable like one of them is going to be compromised for sure um and all those values like i really like this analogy um i don't know if it's very popular book in it's at all uh the the little prince in the little prince um they say like Drunks person, God is wine. A businessman, God is money. Uh, and I think we can do the same analogy for Bitcoiners. Like for Venezuelan people, Bitcoin is a great store of value because of, because of its hard cap. For somebody who lives in police state, Bitcoin is the most valuable because of unconf- unconfiscatability. Oh my God, what the fucking word? Uh, yeah. So for each of us, found like the most valuable thing about bitcoin but all those features together make it the perfect money and uh i think that's why it's so valuable just remember your first principle remember why it's so perfect and that's how you're gonna be safe from shit coins yeah i I like that little prince example because it reminds me of um the the blind man touching the elephant and they all think it's a different animal because they're all touching different parts of it like you know the parts that are closest to them and that's actually a really good a uh, really good example right there katie and i, I just want to add that bitcoin has value because humans have given it value you know like there's subjective value people have subjectively viewed it to be valuable and have thus put in their their hard-earned wealth into it and believe in it and hodl and here we are we're touching 10 10k again so it's a beautiful thing. Um, um, I think are we are we out of topics? We're almost at we're almost at an hour, so we can uh, we can riff. But does anyone in the um in the chat want to unmute their mic and ask any questions or say any comments they have? What's up, guys? What up, dude? What's up? Uh, Six show. Third time, so good. <laughs> OG Bitcoin Kindergarten OG. Yeah, it was actually a getting back to that. Um, I guess Bitcoin per person, uh, comment. That that like calculation alone makes me so bullish. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> For real, it, right? Because if you do, yeah, like if you if you do the math, it's about like three hundred and seventy to four hundred people's worth. A Bitcoin for one Bitcoin. So imagine having one Bitcoin and you have basically the like total amount of 400 other people's money, like just sitting there on your wallet. Like you're in top quarter percent. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, if you check that site, I think you only need like 0.72. Or seventy-five percent of a Bitcoin to be in like the point oh 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 one percent of the world, based on world distribution. So most people will probably only have about, uh, I think it's like four dollars worth of Bitcoin, like based on wealth distribution. I don't know. It's just it's just insane. Every time I think about it, <laughs> it it. it it makes you just like go crazy because it's like you can buy more Bitcoin right now for like you can buy like 20 bucks worth of Bitcoin right now and have more than some people will ever own in their entire life. Yeah, I think I'm it's like super it, sad, but like cool. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good comment about people thinking they're too late. No, you're not. Not by any means. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially if you're listening to this now, like you're early. Yeah, it's really crazy to think about. Imagine being, imagine being in here like 2011, getting free whole bitcoins from faucets. Ugh. <laughs> pizza, yeah. twenty twenty thousand bitcoins for pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, sorry, I was still in high school. 
didn't get into Bitcoin. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I was too. But it, it's yeah, it's still early. It's crazy. I love seeing screenshots from all the way back then of people getting like five Bitcoin from a faucet, and it's just like Jesus fucking Christ. That's like <laughs> like fifty grand right now. Well, but then it was it was a little more riskier bet. I feel like it, mm-hmm. now we have so much good education. You know the the knowledge has been spread out to everyone, and and normal people like us, well, relatively normal people like us, can understand it and see the value prop in it, and it, it's just amazing. It blows my mind all the time that we're here right now, and you know we're in this position. It's it's really humbling. Mm-hmm. That also, um, it that also like solidifies in my mind that um, altcoins won't be able to take over Bitcoin or like, and also um, this is kind of like our only shot at um, Bitcoin because no coin created today will ever have. It's impossible for that coin to go through the same exact organic growth that bitcoin went through you know bitcoin really had to go through is this just is this a joke or is this like an actual thing you know you got like cyberpunk nerds just you know buying and selling it online in you know 2010 2011 you know and then it started to catch on more and more and people are like wow this is this isn't a joke this isn't a game this is a real fucking thing and um yeah like it just makes me um, trust Bitcoin more. It makes me like it so much more that it went through those hard times because it made it harder and a better money, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Man, I was so <laughs> bullish after last show. I think I'm just as bullish, guys. I might have to go do some sprints. <laughs> Don't mean to cut I'm going to stack for it right now. I, I already did. I already now. stacked a couple dollars, guys. My bank account's slim, stack. but I just stacked a little bit. Fiat broke. Fiat broke, but sat rich. Hey, let's go. <laughs> well, good having you join us, Denez. Always a pleasure. Much love. I had Stay a up. lot of fun. Yeah, yeah you, you guys are great. Kid. This mm-hmm. was awesome. Thanks for every- Thanks to everyone who um, came out. I know a few people left a little early, but... I'm sure they had something better to do, but uh, <laughs> but uh, thanks again to all the OGs who come out all the time. Really means a lot. Yeah, and if you're listening, if you're streaming this later, thanks for listening. We love you. We hope you get some knowledge out of this. And uh, thank you, Katie. You killed it. All right, we're out, guys.